Awesome. Okay. Welcome everyone to the CRCS seminar this week. My name is Kai Wen. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker <laughs> today, <laughs> Professor <laughs> Meredith Go. Professor Meredith Go is an associate professor in the Department of Geographical Science at University of Maryland. <laughs> professor Go's research uses risk concept to build new understanding of human environment relationships and is designed to build scientific evidence for actions. The majority of her activity can be described as convergence research on conservation issues such as wildlife trafficking, illegal logging, fishing, and mining in 15 countries over five continents. Professor Go is a National Academies of Science Jefferson Science Fellow, U.S. Department of State Embassy Science Fellow, and Emerging Wildlife Conservation Leader. She has published over 75 reverie journal articles and book chapters. She is also the editor and author of Conservation Criminology and her co-edited volume, Women and Wildlife Trafficking is expected in early 2022. Let's give a warm welcome to Professor Go and I will hand it over to her. Hi everyone. It's such a pleasure to have a chance to to chat with you all today. Um, thank you so much, um, Milland and, and everybody in your team for the invitation. Um, I think it was either 2012 or 2014 when I first started chatting with you, Milland, and it's just so exciting to see um, how science is advancing in these amazing interdisciplinary spaces. And so it's an honor to have a chance to chat with you all today. And my goal is to kind of provoke thinking and um, maybe opportunities to collaborate. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share, um, I prepared a presentation and um, I'm very happy to take questions during the, during the talk. Um, Kai uh, and, and Hila, you can help me um, make sure that I'm uh, seeing or hearing everything, um, but, I, uh, I, I like, com I like questions in the middle. <laughs> so, or, or during, if anything, uh, if you need any clarification or anything, just let me know. Um, so thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I am going to, um, clean up my, clean up my, uh, my desktop here a little bit. And, um, what I am going to, if I remove my floating panel, then um, maybe Kai, you could just interrupt me and let me know if there's a question. I would really appreciate it. Um, but what I would like to do is talk about uh, illicit global environmental change and some of the uh, science that I use uh, to, to try to better understand this. So I'm going to talk about interdisciplinary intelligence mapping of illicit global and environmental change. As I start, I want to just acknowledge um, my motivations and my privilege as a scientist. I certainly realize that um, I have I work incredibly, incredibly hard, but I've also um, been able to take advantage of, of, of opportunities. I've been able to cross boundaries, not only geographic um, and geopolitical, but also disciplinary um, and stakeholder boundaries. And I think that that makes me incredibly privileged as a scientist and it also um, motivates me to ask lots of questions. Um, I fail all the time. Um, I'm going to talk about some of my research successes today, but I think that um, without kind of uh, fast action and, and fast failure, it's really uh, kind of challenging to uh, not advance your science. And then I'm very motivated by science for society. Um, I completely respect and admire and support scientists that are engaged in kind of bench science, but um, I'm really interested in collaborations with stakeholders on the ground who have problems and trying to help them understand how science can um, inform decisions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, this, the general problem of global environmental change and why it's important. I'm going to um, propose to you all that conservation criminology and interdisciplinary intelligence uh, mapping can advance understanding. Um, I will try to convince you of this um, claim with examples um, of some of my fieldwork uh, from Madagascar, um, which is spelled wrong. I just see that. Sorry about that. Democratic Republic of Congo and Mexico. And then I want to close out by um, talking about some of the research that's on the horizon. 
So um, what is global environmental change? Uh, so certainly um, all of us, uh, just by being um, even somewhat pr productive members of society, know that there are so many um, you know, changes going on in the world right now with regards to the environment. Um, and these are driving human behavior and the human, human experience. So we have drought in places like um, Omo National Park in Ethiopia. Um, we have seen, you know, uh, decreased rainfalls, uh, you know, over, over many, many years. <laughs> Um, in places like Madagascar, we see deforestation, um, which then results in um, over. So this, in this case, it's deforestation for cattle grazing, which then results in massive erosion um, and collateral impacts. This is an in Karafansika National Park in the northwest of Madagascar. We see ocean plastics building up, such as in the Galapagos Marine Reserve in Ecuador. Um, you know, we talk about microplastics and degraded marine ecosystems. There's also um, rising ocean temperatures like in Quintana Roo in Mexico where there are a number of marine protected areas where rising ocean temperatures are having collateral impacts on the um, health and productivity of ocean ecosystems. There's also biodiversity loss, right? So in Limpopo National Park in Mozambique where I work, there is um, you know, wildlife poaching and wildlife trafficking that goes on that contributes to biodiversity loss. So these are all just regular, <laughs> this is the background, this is background noise on, on biodiversity loss. Um, and these, these, these global environmental changes result in degraded human environment relationships. Um, and so this is what we call the Anthropocene, right? This is the era of humans. Um, and so two of the defining characteristics of, or four, I guess, defining characteristics of this um, Anthropocene are these, the likelihood and impact of degraded ecosystems, the diversity scope and scale, the cost and associated system failures, and then there's just a lot of connectivity. And so what I wanna do is just provide some examples of this degradation, this, these degraded human environment relationships. So the World Economic Forum um, releases this global risk perception survey annually. And what they do is they survey um, around the world according to five different risk categories and they color code them. So there's economic risks, environmental risks, geopolitical, societal, and technological. And they've been tracking perceptions of risk for, for decades now. Um, and so what I wanted to do was share results from 2020. So the top risks by likelihood, you can see um, that the green categories are, you know, four of the five top likelihood perceived risks. Um, again, if you look at the top risk by impacts, you can see um, three of the five by impact are associated with the environment. Um, and granted, this was taken during 2020, so it kind of makes sense to me that infectious diseases and, and COVID were, 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 were up there. Another way of thinking about this um, survey is to think about change over time in perceptions. And so what's really interesting is if you just kind of relax your eyes and look at the green popping out of this, this, this matrix, what you can see is that in 2020, um, 2020 was the first year ever where the top five rated perceived risks were all in this environmental category. Um, and so environmental risks, the, the likelihood and impact of environmental risks has never been more salient in society today. Another way of looking at this is the scope and scale. So I, I share this slide to, to show scope. Um, extinction risk. Um, just last week, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced that they were listing, I think it was something like 25 to 30 species as being officially extinct um, in my lifetime, um, you know, or, or even less, to be honest with you. But we see all sorts of species groups, um, cycads, conifers, corals, mammals, reptiles, birds, um, all of these species face extinction risks, um, and these, these, this extinction risk is increasing over time um, because in part of, of anthropogenic causes. And then another way of thinking about scope and scale is to think about the United Nations Office on Disaster Risk Reduction. So they have this 
comparison where they're looking at disaster risk events by type and they compare, you know, 40 years ago versus 20 years ago. And what you can see is that with the exception of mass dry movements, um, and I don't even really understand what that is based on the icon, but like everything else I, I understand is increasing, right? So um, it used to be that these disasters were once in a lifetime and now it's one every, you know, 10 years or, or even less. Um, and these, these, these disasters and disaster risk reduction has massive consequences for human environment interactions. Another way of looking at this issue is by value. Uh, in the human environment relationships is by value. And so transnational crime is, um, you know, there are various measures of how many billions of US dollars per year um, is removed from the global economy um, and going to criminals. Um, this morning I woke up and read about the Pandora Papers um, where you have new estimates of, um, of financial crimes and transnational crimes. But when you think about environmental crimes, you can see illegal logging, illegal fishing, illegal wildlife trade. All of these are, are in the billions of dollars US um, and there are different measures on the United Nations Environmental Program, um, you know, conducted the surveys in 2014, 2016, and then global financial integrity um, has also provided some estimates. The estimates vary, but for the most part, what we know is that there are billions of dollars US every year that are being removed from the global economy to go to criminals. Not good. Um, connectivity. Uh, the last indicator here is just, you know, we are increasingly connected. So this is a flow chart of global rhino horn flows. Um, and the, the, the organization C4 ADS in 2019 put out this, 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 this flow map for global rhino horns showing, you know, horns are going from Mozambique to Malaysia to China um, Swaziland to Taiwan, you have South Africa to China to Laos um, to Thailand. And so you have all of this connectivity that never really existed before that's being created by illegal wildlife markets. Um, and certainly this is an issue that we've been thinking about when we think about um, COVID, <laughs> but um, it's relevant beyond COVID as well. So, so what does it all mean when global environmental change turns illegal? Well, there are a number of different um, uh, kind of indicators. The first is violence. There's violence against people and animals. Um, there's also, you know, the, the rule of law, it's undermined. So our systems of governance, which are designed to be robust and just and transparent, they're undermined. Um, and then this has follow on implications for other spaces like uh, drugs, guns, humans, um, even health or education. So sustainable development, you know, we have investments that taxpayers make and donors make on sustainable development investments all around the world. Those returns on investment are decreased through illegal uh, global environmental change. Taxable revenue decreases. Um, cultural resources are degraded and excluded and um, local people and indigenous communities are not able to uh, use resources in the way that they want. And then zoonotic diseases of invasive and invasive species are essentially given like new pathways are created um, and new vectors are created for these for these diseases to spread. Are you guys coming in? Or are you just barking at me? They're just barking at me. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so um, it was eye opening to see that uh, whereas illegal wildlife trade was in like maybe 5 billion on your slides uh, just two slides ago. The illegal logging was, I don't know, 10 times, 20 times, 30 times more. Yeah. Um, where is the illegal, I mean, I guess, is this being shipped? Uh, the wood that's uh, the illegal logging, I mean, what, what is the trade? Is, is it going in trade? Is it uh, being shipped from one country to another? Is it just being used for local uh, paper mills or something like that? Where is the product going? Yeah, I mean, any any and all, to be honest with you, um, a lot of the products are being used for housing, right? So there's hardwoods, there's furniture, there's musical instruments. Um, you know, a, a lot of what I think about is 
just the housing boom, right? And just general construction. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the times illegal logging is happening and people are actually using the wood. Other times you have illegal logging and deforestation that's happening for um, uh, agriculture, right? So there's, there's, there's places that are being illegally logged so that agricultural commodities can be planted. Um, or um, minerals can be mined, or um, just general development. So it, it, sometimes the logs themselves are used, and other times they're used for agricultural purposes. So they're shipped all around the world, they're shipped locally. Um, so it could be illegal, illegal logging of a particular species of tree, or it could be the land, or it could be the method of take. Um, all of that is kind of lumped into these, into these estimates. Thank you. Any other questions right now? I have a question. Um, and the question is about policies for what is illegal versus what is what is okay. Yeah. Um, and how if, if those are consistent across borders, and also if if you have a comment about that. They're um, not. They're not they're not consistent at all. Um, they're not consistent in, in the United States across states. Um, the the de degrees of illegality and the seriousness of a crime um, vary, um, and the penalties vary. And and in some ways, that's not unique to environmental crime, right? That's unique to things like homicide or drugs, or um, you know, just to pick on the United States. You know, there are certain states right now that are proposing that abortion is illegal, right? So different states have different rules, different countries have different rules. Um, and then also different countries have different criminal justice systems, right? So um, one of my favorite examples is Namibia, which has a completely different um, criminal justice system than the United States, and they need corroborating evidence. So if you're gonna be successfully tried in a court of law in Namibia, you essentially need two pieces of evidence for every uh, like one piece of evidence that would be fine in the United States, for example. So how are you supposed to kind of make those um, kind of legal requirements compatible? Um, in the United States and in many other countries, we have um, like forensic evidence that could be introduced into a court of law and our um, our judges and our magistrates are educated in what is forensic evidence. How does it support or oppose a crime? Um, there are other countries in the world that do not accept forensic evidence because they can't. They don't have the capacity. Their judges aren't um, educated on on what this means, etc. So it's a it's a very complicating uh, dimension in terms of scale. You're absolutely right. Any other questions? All right, I'm just gonna keep, if it's okay with you guys, I'm gonna keep this bar here so I can see you all, um, or this thing here. So, so, so if you're gonna study this, <laughs> it's messy. Um, I, I, think, I think it's safe for me to say that it's an ugly data pipeline. <laughs> um, it's ugly. Uh, the science is ugly, but you know, I think that also makes it really interesting, right? So, so what makes it ugly? Um, the stakeholders. So there's a lot of stakeholders. Um, some of the stakeholders are silent, right? A tree can't speak, a lemur can't speak. Um, and then they have limited societal inter interfaces. They have different methods of communication. The languages are different. Um, and so we have a really hard time, um, you know, maximizing the interfaces that stakeholders and victims have. Behaviors um, are sometimes covert and sometimes overt. Um, I think we also fail to recognize that offenders can be highly adaptable. Um, sometimes we think that offenders are um, not that smart or maybe not that kind of capable and they're doing this, they're doing illegal behavior because they're not that intelligent or they couldn't do something else. And that's not always true. So we have a wide variety of behaviors that are, are, are in play. And then the data is super ugly, <laughs> um, super messy, right? So the data is really fragmented. It's not comprehensive. Um, sometimes there's a reluctance or an inability to share data. Um, we do have issues of um, ethics in data collection and transparency and privacy. Um, so this is ugly, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite messy, but that doesn't mean that science doesn't still 
have something to offer. Um, what I would propose to you is that if we're going to be dealing with the scientific solutions or a scientific basis, we need to be thinking about at least three different kind of domains, conservation biology, criminal justice and crime and criminology, uh, sorry, criminology and crime science, and then risk and decision-making. So we need to understand how, you know, ecological organisms um, interact, how, what ecosystem relationships are, um, and what kind of social values are with regards to livelihood preservation. We also need to understand the opportunity theories of crime. What creates an opportunity for crime to be created in the first place? Um, how do we control and prevent crime? Um, and then there's this human behavior dimension. How do we predict it? How do we promote desirable human behavior? And then how do we translate that risk insight into effective governance? So what I've been working on is this idea of conservation criminology. So not every global environmental change should be thought of this way. Um, not every illicit global environmental change should be thought about this way, but many can. Um, so when you have some sort of situation where you have rules that are being violated or harms that are being inflicted, um, you know, you have a rule of law being broken, um, you have something, you know, some activity like illegal logging that's contributing to the global criminal economy. Um, you have risk information, you have risk assessment, risk perception, you're trying to understand how different groups of people like experts and lay people think about risk. Um, and then you also have criminology and criminal justice. So, you know, what do we think about deterrence? What do we think about guardians? Uh, what do we think about, you know, police uh, ethics and behavior? And then certainly there's a natural resource policy and management dimension here. Which species are we interested in talking about? Um, how do these species contribute to their ecosystem? There's like an ecosystem function. So when you put all this together, uh, you can think about conservation crime. And then what I would argue is that if you take this perspective, um, what I'm going to hypothesize and try to prove to you now is that two things emerge, right? So I'm interested in science for solutions. And so the first thing that conservation criminally criminology does is it changes the data landscape. Um, it also introduces new solutions. It can bring new solutions to the table. And then it also can bring new solution like implementers, uh, like a partner or a new stakeholder to the table that can help um, Im Im implement and then resolve these problems. So the methodology that I've been using a lot uh, to achieve conservation criminology related science is interdisciplinary intelligence mapping. So what is that and how does it how does it look? What I would like to do is offer three kind of compelling, hopefully compelling examples of uh, of this in action. So Madagascar, and I'm going to talk about illegal logging and wildlife trafficking. Um, if somebody's interested, you can ask me why I'm choosing to show a picture of an empty airplane that I traveled on. This was my airplane. Um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, there's urban wildlife trafficking. So trafficking in great apes, pangolins, and dwarf crocodiles. And then in Mexico, we have illegal unreported and unregulated fishing. So we're going to go on a little bit of a field trip right now. Before we really uh, take off on our, you know, uh, hypothetical airplane here, everything that I'm going to show you involves flows, and these flows have a basic schematic. There's this source production, a transit transportation, and then a destination consumption space, and there are conservation criminology dimensions across and between all of these kind of places. So, you know, it's possible to measure and analyze this data across the supply chain. Um, and this is a really, really, really oversimplified model of the supply chain, but honestly, it doesn't get any more complicated in practice. Um, that's just how, I guess I would say, juvenile our science is so far. So Meredith, uh, may I ask another question Please. here? Criminology is, uh, you know, so you may be aware of work like uh, Jeff Brandingham, uh, the Brandinghams in general on criminology, you know, right. uh, his, his parents and so forth. How does uh, conservation criminology specialize uh, that discipline? Does it differ from uh, criminology as it's uh, studied particularly in urban settings? Um, and 
you know, there, there is uh, obviously some criticism of uh, criminology in the in the urban settings, um, uh, particularly as it relates to predictive uh, predicting crime and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I wanted to get your perspective on that. Maybe you could leave it to the end of your presentation if you wish. Yeah, I will. I think that's a really good question. Um, and I and I will, and it definitely builds upon and then also pushes back, I think, on some of the assumptions of of theory. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll make a note about that. Um I think one of the most important um contributions is that you know the idea of a crime triangle right and so this isn't necessarily Brantingham uh Brantingham's like foundational research but to the extent that you're talking about the opportunity structure that enables crime right so this is something that was originally kind of that Felson and, and Cohen and then and then Ron Clark have really advanced this is more the idea of crime science as opposed to criminology um, more how crime happens as opposed to why um, so say you have some sort of crime or some harm this is what you're interested in well the crime triangle tells you that in order to have this crime occur, you need three ingredients to overlap in space and time, a motivated offender, a suitable target, and a lack of guardianship. And so when these three variables overlap, you have an opportunity for crime that's created. So then if you're going to try to prevent crime from occurring, you need to prevent the overlap in space and time of these three variables. Now, what's really challenging, um, and I, I, I'll throw this out there, Milland, as one, as one example, when you're talking about natural resource crime, we have less legitimacy of rules. Um, you know, I think most people would agree that in an urban setting, you know, going up to somebody at point blank range and killing them with a handgun is criminal. <laughs> Um, when it comes to illegally logging, trespassing, you know, illegally logging for furniture, wood, or, um, you know, killing a wildlife species for, for bushmeat, there's a lot of challenges associated with whether or not something is even agreed to be a harm. Um, do people even know that it's a harm? Do they know it's a crime, et cetera? So whose crime, I think, is really important to think about. So in Madagascar, uh, you know, so Madagascar is, you know, the only place on earth where you can find lemurs, like this black and white rough lemur, the plowshare tortoise, and then also these like amazing, amazing chameleons. So this is my ball cap. This is like a uniball fine tip pen cap, right? So super cool animals and really unique place. And it's a biodiverse rich place. And um, why does that matter? Well, it matters for a whole host of sort of value reasons or value propositions. Some of them are financial and some of them are like religious in nature. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we did in Madagascar is we were interested in illegal rosewood logging, right? So rosewood is illegally logged for hardwood furniture for musical instruments. And so we went in and we, we used a base map. And so this is based on land cover data. You know, you can download this from, you know, Google, wherever. And we were interested in where the forests are. So we took this forest cover map and we were also able to get like GIS layers of like watershed demarcation, where the protected areas were, and also like land use types. And then we took a we took a plastic overlay and we engaged in participatory intelligence mapping of or sorry participatory mapping of the crime triangle. So where are the targets? Where are the offenders? Where are the guardians? Where are the flows? Where are the stockpiles? Where are the warehouses? Now this is a major scale. A lot of the times when um, police are mapping a crime triangle, they might be doing this in a very 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 okay. I want both dogs in the house. Come in. You're bothering me. Um, so the idea here is that this is like over a really big scale. Um, and so what we do is we give people markers and stickers and we have them create their own legends and, and we just let them map their, their local knowledge. And then we replicate this. We replicate this with different groups of individuals with different lived experiences. And that enables us to um, come up with a different picture. 
of the problem. So then what we do is we digitize and we symbolize the information. Um, and so a couple things that I'll draw your attention to. The first is, you know, people, humans put trees down on the map. And that's great, right? So this is complementary to the land cover data um, or like satellite imagery, for example. Um, what we also saw is that people were able to risk from low, medium, high, the rate of illegal logging, right? So in some places you have high rates, high perceived rates of illegal logging, but you do have some medium and you do have there, some low places as well. Um, we also see lots of different colored triangles on this map. So in Madagascar, there are many, many, many different kinds of police authorities. And so they're color coded here, but they're all demarcated. They're all the guardians are demarcated with a, with a triangle. And so what's interesting is like, you know, okay, here's a high risk of illegal logging area, essentially on top of Madagascar National Parks. That is not a good situation. <laughs> so this would draw my attention and I might say, you know, I need to see what's happening here and, and maybe try to invest some energy in preventing this from happening in the future. Here's a low risk area on top of another kind of police. So maybe this is like, these are, these are best practices. Maybe this is something to be replicated. Um, so this symbology here really helped us to sort of get a different picture of what was happening on the ground. Also, I'm sure you noticed that people put high illegal logging risk areas in the ocean. Humans never follow instructions, right? So I was like, why are they putting illegal logging in the ocean? Well, it turns out that these folks knew exactly not only the flows on land, but the flows on water. And so we were able to see where the container ships that are coming down from um, you know, the Horn of Africa are coming down and where they're actually intercepting the, um, the, um, the logs. So this was really interesting. And so then you can start doing more advanced analytics, right? You can start doing, um, you know, look at uh, illegal logging by watershed risk and start color coding, you know, high, medium and low risk areas. And this can also offer you a, um, a, a way of thinking prospectively, right? So if you look at the watersheds, the watersheds are rated, you know, low, blue, red, high, but also there are um, illegal logging areas that are low, blue, red, high. And so you can see, you know, a high, high place is definitely someplace to invest resources in the future. And then you can also make it, uh, you know, you can do more color coding and, and, and really create kind of a hot map, uh, a hot spot and cold spot map. What was really cool about this project is kind of like, okay, well, so what? <laughs> um, oh, wait, before I do that, I'm going to show you another example. Um, and I think Kai, we've, we've talked about this. So this is for plowshare tortoise trafficking. These animals are found only in this place in, um, in the Northwest part of the country. And so what we were able to do here is again, go through this participatory mapping exercise where local groups of people were able to sort of use markers and stickers and, and, and tape and whatever, and, and they create their own legend. And then we, digitize it, right? And so here we see where the plowshare tortoise is, where the animals to poach, where the poachers camps, um, where the origins of the poachers, where do the um, animals originate? Um, and so, you know, is in terms of like a static point in time picture, this is really insightful, but then what do you do about it? Again, we wound up, um, you know, digitizing and then analyzing this data. So we were here, we were able to get this root information and then we were able to sort of essentially try to understand the risk factor per space. And so this enables a more proactive way to prevent crime from occurring in the first place. And this, it may seem tautological, but the fact of the matter is, is that this is the area where the animals are found. This is the only place on the planet where these tortoises are found. So it doesn't always make intuitive space to be investing in crime prevention someplace else. But that's like a mind blowing conclusion um, from some of this from some of this data. So 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 here comes the so what. So so what happens with this research? Well, we changed the data landscape. We thought about measuring different variables for analysis. It helped us to reconceptualize our space and place with the, with the problem of interest. Um, we also, you know, I know in, in computer science, you know, and in criminology um, in particular, we tend to think that humans engage in rational choice, uh, but that's not the case, right? Um, my favorite example of this is 
donuts. I love donuts. I know rationally that donuts, there's no nutritional value. They're not healthy, blah, blah, blah. I still choose to eat them. Um, so I am proof positive that people don't engage in rational choice. So then how are we supposed to model this? Um, and so trying to start understanding the bounds of rationality and when does rational choice kind of come into play, I think can, uh, is part of the human behavioral dimension that this work can build on. The other thing is that these methods can scale up and down. So you can go from like a neighborhood and an urban environment to a protected area or maybe even a part of a country. You can also scale over. So go from illegal logging to illegal wildlife trade. Um, the other thing that I thought was super cool, this project in particular resulted in new partnerships. And so this was, I think, the first time um, that I think, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Millen, that we were able to sort of say, okay, well, what happens when you start to feed some of this illegal logging information into, you know, algorithms and computational approaches that can optimize interventions, the place, the intervention itself, um, thinking about how to allocate resources in an incredibly limited resource space. Um, so this was a really exciting, um, you know, so what, because we were able to sort of say, look, there's different kinds of solutions out there and there's different kinds of scientists that could be involved at the table to help, um, you know, build this discussion further. So I'm going to pivot to Mexico. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about Madagascar. Um, I assume you'll interrupt me, but um, just wanted to offer. Uh, the question is, what is, what was it earlier? <laughs> well, earlier Sorry, can you, Lucy, stop. Can you restate that? Where's the mic in the room? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's the dog. Sorry. Uh, the question is, what was the airplane photo about in your earlier slide? The airport. The bet. Thank you for remembering. So, <laughs> why does it matter? So I was flying home. Oh, now I'm going for it. So I was flying home <laughs> from this trip and I missed my flight. I paid for my ticket on American Express. I know that I paid for my ticket. And um, when we left Sawala, somebody knocked on my door. I don't know if I should say this on YouTube live. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, but let's talk offline. Um, <laughs> what I can tell you why was I on an airplane? I was, I was on an airplane that was being used to launder proceeds from illegally logged wood, okay? And so I'm a citizen buying an airplane ticket using my American Express, like trying to do the right thing, doing things legally, and I'm supporting money laundering, money laundering that is using natural resources. So that's another thing that kind of makes this connection. And it's a really, really good story. So afterwards, we can talk about it. Um, and it just really <laughs> illustrates the intersectionality of it, 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 it shows the intersectionality and also the, 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 um, the connectivity of all of this and how someone like me, who's trying to do the right thing, buying an airplane ticket legally is actually participating in something that's lining somebody else's pockets illegally, which is what the Pandora papers also show a little bit as well. Ask me again. Any other questions about Madagascar? <laughs> Mexico is really interesting. In Mexico, um, there's uh, sea cucumbers and there's um, a number of species. So in, in Mexico has a lot, a lot of, of coasts. What I'm talking about is in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Yucatan. And so sea cucumber fishing is a really lucrative industry that is sometimes connected with the organized crime cartels. And so it's really interesting, like what would a kind of sleepy seaport have to do with organized crime and how are sea cucumbers linking them? Um, and so this is, this is an interesting, um, this is really interesting. And this is where I think we have so much opportunity for synergy. Um, the, the theoretical approach that we've adopted in trying to measure variables in this space is prime place network interactions. And this is almost an a theoretical idea that's been born in Cincinnati and Las Vegas for homicide um, and, and violent gun, uh, violent gun um, use. 
And what we're trying to see is, you know, if you're just looking at crime statistics, where the, where the homicide sites are or where the gunshots are, you see crime sites, right? And so you have a crime map um, that's built on this data, which is awesome. Um, what contemporary thinking tells us is that we need to be thinking about place network interactions. So if you're not going to engage in systematic investigation, you're going to completely miss out on these other spaces that are super important for crime prevention. Comfort spaces. Where do offenders go when they're not hanging out? Corrupting spots. Where do new, where do new offenders come from? Like, how are they kind of brought into the fold? Where does corruption happen? And then convergent spaces, like where does wildlife crime interact with human trafficking or um, loitering or littering or drugs? Um, and so you can see, you know, these, these, these places can be mapped um, and they can be mapped using different sorts of data. Crime data is often like from a police, um, it, it's reported. Um, and then these places have to be um, systematically investigated. And so what we've been doing with sea cucumbers is we've been engaging local people in mapping these places based on their lived experience. So yet again, you have people engage in mapping, you replicate the methodology, you digitize it, and you're able to come up with some maps. And the maps tell us um, you know, in, in a regular city, in, in, in any city, you know, what is it, what are these places, what's the spatial relationship? So here's, here, let me just walk you through this. There's comfort spaces, corrupting spots, convergence settings, and crime sites. So they're color coded. And so you can see different color spaces, but then we also have places. So bodegas are, are in red. Housing for non-locals is in blue. Um, you know, you have a city hall, you have fishing cooperatives, um, and then you can see flows and the directionality. So you can see places where inputs happen, places where information is flowing, and then also places where products are flowing. So a couple things that stand out to me. First of all, sea cucumber trafficking, not just an issue for the ocean. So if the only place that we're ever focusing our efforts on sea cucumber trafficking is in the place where the sea cucumbers live, which is always in the ocean, we're totally missing half of the picture. The second thing that you can see is that there's some really interesting like high-low relationships. This I think is really noteworthy. Cor comfort spaces are next to crime sites. So a comfort space is a place where you could potentially intervene. And then who's, who's associated with these comfort spots? Are these pop-up this is housing where local women are able to like use Airbnb or use VRBO and essentially legally benefit off of an illegal activity. Um, and that's kind of a good thing for these women, right? It's like extra money. It's a business enterprise. Um, there's like a lot of good things associated with that. Um, if you're just looking at it this way. Um, so that also kind of uh, helps to understand um, the rationality part and why people make decisions the way they do. So we go out and we measure these PNI categories using participatory mapping. That's great. The next thing that we've started doing is giving people um, tablets to go out and kind of measure these places and spaces themselves. And this is where scale really comes in. If you zoom out, you might see, oh, there's a couple of dots out in the ocean, sea cucumber crime, sea cucumber crime. It's out in the ocean. And then when you start to zoom in, you can see places, there's definite crime clusters in this particular town. You might also then see, you know, again, instead of looking out in the ocean where it's really hard to sort of um, anchor yourself spatially, you can start seeing hot, hot spots and cold spots um, and, and where hot spots overlap with cold spots as well. And so then the question becomes, um, what are we going to do about this? Well, the first thing that we've noticed is that there's this huge change in the data landscape for illegal fishing. So we need to be thinking about ocean and land spaces and places. So is there now an opportunity for like remote sensing, which might be able to help us cover lots and lots of area? Can we develop um, pattern matching and like machine learning algorithms to help us process lots and lots of data, particularly over the oceans where... Um, remote sensing has typically not had as many advances as it has um, in, in aquatic areas or in, in ocean areas. We also start to see the socio-environmental system. So we're seeing the connectivity between humans and this ecosystem a lot here. 
Um, some of the other things that are really noteworthy about this project is that we have local cooperatives who are involved in collecting data now. So this is a new data source. It's not just relying on the police to collect data. Um, importantly, um, the fisheries collapsed. So when I was there in June, we saw that the sea cucumber fishery has collapsed. And so now what do you do in a data landscape where you essentially have lost one variable? Um, and unfortunately, this is not unique in conservation. Um, you know, I just said Fish and Wildlife Service just said that um, 25 species just went, are going to be put on the, have gone extinct. It's not that this is a new issue. Um, this is a contemporary issue. This is happening now and it's going to happen more. So we need to get better at understanding what happens when something goes extinct. How does the socio-environmental system shift when a species goes extinct? Um, and so I think there's a lot of really exciting uh, solution implementers here. The, the fishing cooperatives have been amazing in data generation. And through new partnerships, they've actually created a new marine protected area for sea cucumbers. How this is going to work within the scope of a fisheries collapse is something for a fish biologist. Um, but this is the kind of thing that gives me hope. Excuse me. Um, this is the kind of thing that gives me hope. New partnerships. I'm going to now pivot to DRC, unless anybody has any questions about Mexico. So in DRC, I'm going to Africa into the mega city of Kinshasa. So this is a city of 12 million people, very, very large. Um, and in Democratic Republic of Congo, you have the Congo River. Um, and there's uh, great apes, there's gorillas, there's chimpanzees, there's bonobos, there's pangolins, there's crocodiles. And so there's this movement of bushmeat um, from rural to urban ecosystems. And this movement, um, a lot of the urban bushmeat is illegal. And so how do we start thinking about understanding the flows here? So what this map shows is uh, a, a pangolin group, a gorilla, a, a great ape group and a dwarf crocodile group. So they're color coded. Um, and so you can see there's some overlap in the flows, but then there's some differences in the flows. And so this is like the flow structure and also stop points. Um, and so it's really interesting to start seeing, okay, well, there's some similarities and some differences and how much of this is based on the city itself versus the product. Um, and so you have to think about what's the, um, what's the appropriate unit of analysis to start studying? It's also, I wanted to share um, this example with you because not all participate, not all interdisciplinary intelligence mapping um, involves a uh, geopolitical map. Sometimes we can use a sociogram. And so here, what we've done is we've delineated different kinds of people across source, transit, and destination geographies. And what we've done is we've also color coded them by restaurant tours. So um, urban bushmeat is consumed by, by people in cities. And sometimes there's like low tier restaurants, middle tier restaurants, and then upper tier restaurants. Um, and these can be um, divided usually by like the price point on the menu, right? And kind of like the the um, the formality of the the restaurant itself. And so what's really interesting is you can see the the connectivity of all of these different kinds of individuals um, according to restaurant. Um, and so this can help you parse out again who's involved and maybe what their decision process is in moving illicit goods. Um, this is another way of delineating um, a, an intelligence map where you can think about who are the people that are buying, who's using, who's selling, who has certain knowledge, um, and how does this information flow and how does knowledge flow. I think that understanding this contextual dimension is really essential for the accuracy of understanding our landscape. Um, and so I just wanted to show that this is data that can be collected using standard uh, you know, social science methods. And then we've also used this hot product analysis. So this is something that was born, um, I think in the streets of Detroit and it was used a lot. Maybe it was, maybe it was Newark. It was like a big US city. Um, and so the idea is like, what's hot now? Is it Hondas versus Toyotas? Like what's the car that uh, illegal, that pe the burglars are stealing? What makes it hot? High value, um, low inertia, 
high visibility, high accessibility. And so what we did here is we wanted to see what wildlife was a hot product because this is like a trend. It's kind of like, <laughs> I just took my 10 year old shopping and she bought mom jeans. And I'm just looking at her and I'm like, you're buying mom jeans. I can't believe this. I can't believe this is hot right now. It's a trend. Okay. <laughs> I bought her the mom jeans, but like, when is this going to change? And why is it a hot product? This is exactly why people steal cars. It's exactly why people <laughs> engage in, um, in urban bushmeat trafficking. And so you can think about what's the most requested, what's the easiest to cook, what's the easiest to find fresh. So you can simply ask people and replicate and determine, you know, which species. Hello, Mary, yes. Uh, I think we had only two or three minutes left. Just oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm almost done. Um, so what we were able to do was kind of wrap up this, uh, we were able to do this hot product analysis. And so here we were able to change our uh, data landscape by doing different audience analyses and negative space mapping. And we were also able to include um, restaurateurs in our solution space and as implementers. So what I was gonna do in the last kind of um, bit of my talk where we can just kind of have a free flow of ideas was just talk about what's on the horizon. And so I have three ongoing projects right now, um, detecting and interdicting wildlife trafficking supply chains, disrupting wildlife trafficking networks through convergence of physical and virtual ecosystems, and then women and wildlife trafficking. So what I was going to do is like let the audience choose and I could talk about one of them. But I think because we're close to the end, I'm just going to go here and invite questions. And if somebody wants me to chat more about one of these projects that I have going on, I'm very happy to. But I hope what I've done today is provoke thinking about the ways that the data landscape can be changed through interdisciplinary intelligence mapping and a conservation criminology perspective, and also how a changed landscape results in different kinds of solutions and solution implementers. Um, so with that, Kai, if it's okay, I'll turn it back to you and you can tell me how we should best, best proceed. Thank you again for having me and sorry for all my dog distractions. <laughs> no, thank you for all the amazing talk. Let's unmute ourselves or use your virtual hand to thank uh, Professor Go again. And I think we have five or six more minutes for questions. So feel, feel, please feel free to unmute yourself. I had one uh, question. Uh, in terms of getting the attention of local law enforcement and governments, what kind of data have you seen to be the most effective? So I think that they really um, respond to data that is prevent presented in a law enforcement or criminal justice perspective. Um, so I would say the data users almost, if you will. Um, and so what's going to help, what is evidence that can help build a case or evidence that can help, um, allocate resources more effectively to do their job or for detection. Um, I do think that the data tends to be more on the, um, how to convict offenders as, a as opposed to preventing mm -hmm. offense. But I think that's just the nature of the field so far. And one more question. If you have time, I'm really curious to understand what you mean by women and wildlife trafficking and what is the connection, so. Sure. Yeah. Should I, Kai, do you, uh, what other kinds of questions do you have? I think I have one slide on women and wildlife trafficking if you guys are interested. Yeah, sure, let's do that. Yeah. Um, I can do that and I can answer um, Arpita's question. So women and wildlife trafficking, really interesting. Women are half of the world's population, half of the problem or half of the solution. Almost nobody thinks about the role of women in wildlife trafficking. And so I'm working on this project right now with um, Helen Agu at the University of Nigeria, Nusaka. And what we've done is we've come up with six um, roles that women can play in wildlife trafficking. They can be offenders, defenders, um, observers, like a journalist or a scientist, 
influencer like a mother or a grandmother or a wife or a girlfriend, um, they can benefit. Um, women are able to sort of uh, draw more income, gain social status, gain financial independence. Women are also victims. So they can be widowed, um, they can be targeted, they can suffer from psychological uh, you know, harm, et cetera. And so what we've been starting to do now is try to understand the percent involvement of different women in different wildlife trafficking roles. And I think this really broadens the conversation beyond just like women as defenders. So we talk a lot about, you know, these all female ranger teams, which are amazing. Um, and then we talk about high profile women, like the ivory queen, who's been, um, who has been uh, convicted, but for the most part, we don't do a good job talking about all the ways that women can be involved. So this to me means if we're missing half of the problem, we're missing half of the solution. Um, and so there's like a really huge space to grow in this, in this arena. So I think that's really interesting. Um, Arpita uh, talked about crowdsourcing data and citizen reporting nearby crimes that may have witnessed, absolutely. Um, I don't think that there's like a real organized way to get this done yet. Um, we're trying to understand, like, I think that there are some places where, um, like the Wildlife Trafficking Institute in India, I think is starting to do this for, um, for some turtle and tortoise trafficking. I think there's also uh, the idea of crowdsourcing on like some of the social media or like social marketplaces and seeing kind of what's being reported there. So sometimes somebody might intentionally report a wildlife crime and sometimes somebody might accidentally report a crime. Um, and so how can we um, crowdsource data? There's also issues of um, data ethics and, and data confidentiality, but I think that these are issues that can be worked out. Are there any other questions? I have a question about the, the uh, interdisciplinary interactive uh, uh, mapping method that you use. So um, I'm wondering what, uh, so what kind of people are you inviting for doing this kind of uh, mapping? Are they, like, one question is, uh, uh, are they stakeholders? Are they related to the uh, problem so that they have self-interest and they don't necessarily tell the truth about the map? A second, they uh, do they have like bias the knowledge about the map? They might know well some uh, local area of the map, but they might not have complete knowledge of the entire map. Absolutely. So I really appreciate um, your perspectives on social science here. Yes. Um, the bias question, so we replicate, we go through many, many, many replications of these exercises. I expect that everybody has incomplete knowledge. Um, and so it's only with replication that you can get, right? So I might ask women and they like in, yes. So with replication, you can get um, uh, more confidence in the reliability and the validity of your data. We also use projective questioning. So I don't say, you know, Meredith, when you break the rules, where do you do it? I say, Meredith, mm -hmm. you're a faculty yeah. member at the University of Maryland. When you see people breaking the rules, where do you see it happen? Like when you see people parking illegally, where do you see it happen? <laughs> so you're not asking me, do I park illegally on campus? We could do the same thing with like underage drinking on campus. I'm not asking you if you're an underage drinker, but I bet you know the dorms, like you could give me a list of the top three dorms to go to. So then it's, you use projective <laughs> questioning and then you replicate. The final thing that we do is we wind up bringing in stakeholders who you would think have no knowledge of these topics, but actually know a lot. So in Kinshasa, almost all of the supply routes that I showed you are similar to agricultural commodities. So I brought in agricultural economists from the local university who study manioc and rice and, and pork, right? How do those things flow? And so in that way, when you have ghost data for conservation, you can almost like backfill it with, um, agricultural data. So if you know that an illegal commodity is being uh, co-mingled with a legal commodity, ask the experts, like ask the economists, because they know they have to know how the pork 
flows or how the manioc flows. And so it's almost like CRISPR, right? You take a snippet out of the known database and you plug it into the place where it's unknown. Um, and so it's kind of like a, um, a, a combination. You have to replicate that, right? In order to have like confidence. I mean, it's a validity and reliability issue. Um, those are excellent, excellent questions. Thank you for that. All right, I think we 